helpful. So we'll go ahead and get rolling, and and people can join us as they uh, as they come online. So. Uh, just want to welcome everyone today to this webinar on uh, biogas renewable electricity, and we'll be specifically focusing on RFS2 uh, regulatory updates. My name is Susan Olson, and I'm the VP of uh, Products for Ag and Biofuels at Genscape. And I just want to give you a brief introduction to my company, and then I'll introduce you to my, my co-panelists today, and, and they'll also uh, talk about their companies and their background. So um, Genscape is the world's leading provider of, of real-time monitored information, and, and our goal really as a company is to enable better functioning markets for energy and agriculture. So. We're an international company of about 240 employees, and we're headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where I am today. And we also have offices in several locations in the United States and uh, in, in Western Europe. Um, so we're privately held by Daily Mail and General Trust out of London. We've really been working on how do we re revolutionize the QAP and LCFS credit integrity processes by using our monitoring capabilities that we take the workload off of the renewable fuel producer, let them focus on producing the renewable fuel, and let us focus on the compliance aspects as their compliance partners. So um, we've been doing QAPA and B since inception and helped the EPA shape the program. Um, we do QAP quality assurance plans for all fuel types, um, international. And we do customized solutions, so we understand it's not a one-size-fits-all renewable fuel industry. So we also do um, complete compliance solutions. Outside of QAP, we help with registration services and those things, too. We've got about 46 obligated parties um, as, as in our current client base and also uh, have worked with uh, more than 40 renewable fuel producers across three continents uh, in compliance arenas. So, so I'm fortunate today to to have these panelists with me. Um, what we try to do is to put together a, a good panel for you today for this educational webinar so that we can provide viewpoints from commercial engineering and, and compliance perspectives. And I'm pleased to uh, have with us today Randy Lack, who's the Chief Marketing Officer and Co-Founder of Element Markets, and also uh, Iris Caldwell, who's Senior Engineer at First Environment and a compliance expert across uh, several types of uh, environmental fields and, and, and credit markets. So, uh, also, that First Environment does a lot of work in the biogas and renewable electricity spaces. So we really, uh, I, I would like to uh, invite Iris and Randy to introduce their companies in the, in the following slides. And so, uh, Iris, uh, would you want to talk a little bit about uh, First Environment? Sure. Yes. Thanks, Susan. And thanks uh, for the opportunity to participate um, in today's discussion. Um, so First Environment, um, as Susan said, is an environmental engineering um, firm. Um, we're involved in um, a number of environmental uh, compliance and voluntary um, initiatives. Um, we're headquartered in Boonton, New Jersey. I uh, have several offices throughout the U.S., um, including in New York, um, Atlanta. I'm based in Chicago um, and also in California. Um, so apart from um, more traditional environmental engineering uh, type services, we do provide uh, third-party verification and certification uh, greenhouse gas offsets, um, we've been in that space um, now for a number of years, um, also verify uh, corporate emission inventories. Um, we do uh, engineering reviews under the renewable fuel standard um, and also are pre-approved um, by EPA with a quality assurance um, plan um, for REN verification. Um, we're recognized by environmental finance for a number of years now um, as a leading verification body um, so very familiar with verification best practices um, in the environmental space. Um, and then also, as Susan mentioned, um, we work closely with a number of landfills, um, biogas producers um, throughout the U.S. and internationally on greenhouse gas offset projects, and now more recently, um, renewable fuel standard um, biogas projects. Thanks a lot, Iris. Um, really glad to have you uh, here with us and representing First Environment and your expertise uh, in, in these fields. So, um, Randy, would you talk a little bit about Element Markets? Sure, and I appreciate being invited to be on the, uh, the webinar. Um, just a quick background of Element Markets and, and actually the team that's here. So Element Markets is really the commercial side uh, of this webinar. 
we've actually been working with with First Environment and Genscape. Genscape's a QAP provider for element markets for our RID and LTFS generation. First Environment has been our primary engineer in doing our site visits and registrations. Um, our, our background really comes from, we started in 2005, we've become the leading marketer of, of really environmental commodities throughout the United States. That includes biomethane, uh, renewable energy credits, emission credits, greenhouse gases. Uh, we're also active in marketing uh, renewable fuel credits, including RINs and LCFS credits. Um, since our inception, we've transacted over $1.6 billion of environmental commodities. Most of our transactions are originated transactions. We're working direct with counterparties and doing structured transactions either uh, for, for long-term offtake, uh, for biomethane, uh, short-term needs for new source review on emission reduction credits, uh, compliance mandates around greenhouse gases or you know, short to long-term on renewable energy credit generation and compliance. Uh, we currently provide also asset management services for many clients uh, in the electric sector, both between fossil and renewable. That's over 6,000 megawatts of generation that we assist uh, in environmental credit management. Essentially, for a lot of our clients, we're the green phone. So anything that looks green, looks like a green credit, uh, typically that's something that we touch or we can help with or use our expertise to assist with. Uh, we've created extensive expertise in the North American bio biogas market. Uh, we, uh, we collect biogas off country and move it to premium markets, both in renewable electricity and in the renewable fuel standard. Um, we've registered multiple projects under the renewable fuel standard and have, uh, I think, seven pathways now completed under the low carbon fuel standard. In-house, we actually do everything from all of our paperwork and registrations to gas logistics and marketing. So we have in-house in marketing, which transports gas coast to coast in, in many cases. Uh, and we transact with over 800 companies in the environmental markets. Um, so really, if you look at us as a company, uh, any type of a green commodity, that's what we focus on, emissions wrecks, greenhouse gases, and the derivatives of biogas, which in this case are anything from renewable electricity to LCFS and uh, rent. Excellent, excellent. Thank you both for that, the, the introduction. And um, just really want to say I'm really just really appreciative to have your depth in operations and compliance and also, uh, of course, in the commercial aspects of, of the renewable electricity and biogas spaces here today. So to everybody out there, uh, we really appreciate your questions. We think it really enhances the webinar. So there's a questions box uh, in, the, in the corner of the GoToMeeting panel. Uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout the, the webinar, and we'll answer them at the end. Your questions will be answered uh, anonymously, and so only the uh, presenters here can see them, and so we'll ask them again in anonymity. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we'd just like to set the stage with a, a supply and demand picture, kind of through the RFS2 looking glass. And then we'll talk about the current and proposed RFS2 regulations, uh, what's, what's changing in terms of Pathways 2, and, and how does Pathways 2 change the regs for biogas and renewable electricity specifically. And then we'd like to give an update uh, on registration for RFS2. Among the parties that have been represented here today, we have a lot of updated, up-to-the-minute information on registration for, for biogas and renewable electricity. And so we'd like to share with you today the latest guidance. And I think uh, some, of the, some of the things we're going to talk about today are new to the industry and may help shape things um, in a better way uh, in terms of what's required for due diligence going forward. Going forward. So, um, also, we'll talk a little bit about record keeping and reporting, just some important considerations for, for facilities that are involved in, in registering as RFS2 uh, rent generators. And then we'll also talk at the end about maximizing rent credit values and the importance of uh, due diligence in this emerging market. So, <clears throat> so to start with the supply and demand picture, what we're trying to do here is to give a general picture of supply and demand for biogas and renewable electricity through the RFS2 uh, looking glass. So, so in terms, we'll start with biogas. In terms of the biogas supply, uh, the, the landfill methane outreach program is one source of data, and its database lists more than 40 high BTU, LNG, or alternative fuel projects that are currently in operation. Uh, there's also another three they list that are under construction. So, so this is a kind of across the United States. There's 15 states that are represented there. 
a total production capacity of a little less than 150 mm CFD of landfill gas. So um, the one REN per 77,000 BTU, you're looking at a raw potential of about 750 million RENs a year with these, uh, these, these fuel projects that are currently in operation. And, and I know um, Iris and Randy, you know, when we were talking before, you guys had mentioned that there's kind of an important differentiator between the low heating value and the high heating value. I thought it might be uh, good to talk a little bit about that here. Sure. Yeah, I can touch on that a bit. Um, so, right, one of the important notes um, when you're looking at biogas specifically um, and RIN generation is, um, you know, I think typically you look at biogas production data in terms of a volume basis or cubic feet um, or possibly um, energy value um, like MMBTUs or decatherms. Um, but, of course, to um, determine the um, equivalent RIN um, value associated with that gas, um, EPA has established the 77,000 um, BTU um, equivalents um, between um, essentially a, a, a biogas and an equivalent um, ethanol um, gallon um, or, or RIN um, parameter. So I think the, um, the key thing is, it's noted here on the slide, is that that 77,000 BTU conversion is on a low heating value basis. Um, and EPA has provided some guidance um, for converting between high heating value um, to low heating value, um, typically for uh, pipeline um, grade gas. But I think based on our discussions with EPA, um, they expect to see or, or um, have accepted similar sorts of conversions um, in direct use cases as well. Um, so again, key is to look at the low heating value um, basis of your gas when you're when you're doing that REN calculation. Got it, got it. Uh, by the way, Iris, can you hear me? Okay, I just want to double check. I thought that uh, one of the marketing folks said that they couldn't hear me. Um, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, okay, good. Just a quick check there. All right. Th thank you very much for for that. I mean, that's I think that's very important to know those kind of nuances uh, that can make a big difference when you're trying to calculate numbers of rent. So it's really important. Um, another great source of data uh, and a great organization is the Renewable Natural Gas Coalition. Um, they've also got about 40 landfill gas to renewable natural gas projects. And they've estimated in a very uh, precise way that the RNG industry will produce about 167 million ethanol equivalent gallons dedicated to transportation fuel. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of you've got a supply side and then you've also got a demand side that you've got to consider for RFS2. And for RFS2, the, the, the fuel must be used for transportation use if you're going to be able to generate RENs from renewable natural gas. So, so we wanted to give a quick picture of that and then I'm going to just quickly go through these bullets and uh, ask Randy to, uh, if he'll elaborate a little bit more on this from, from his commercial viewpoint. But effectively, if you <clears throat> look at the EIA data, actually the December data just came out recently, uh, there was about 33 BCF was consumed by natural gas vehicles according to the EIA's categories uh, in 2013. So according to the LMOP data, this total renewable natural gas supply capacity is now about 0.15 BCF a day. And, and that includes not just transportation use, but everything out there. So there, there's about a, you know, a one-to-one -one matchup in terms of you know, how much gas is, is produced and how much gas is being consumed uh, based on 2013. Now, however, there is projected growth. We'll, we'll look at that uh, on the next slide. But again, this estimate of the LMOP 0.15 BCF a day, 54 BCF a year, is, includes only the operational high BTU and alternative fuel facilities. So um, RNG for, for transportation use is, is a smaller but still a substantial percentage with the RNG coalition estimating that about 13 BCF will be allocated for transportation use based on contracts in 2014. So. One other important thing to note here about demand is that California demand was about half of the total U.S. demand. And, and why does that matter? And again, we're focusing on RFS2 today, but I think it's worth mentioning that parties may be eligible for LCFS, the low carbon fuel standard credits, in addition to RENs to help offset cost of production if they have an approved pathway. Now that gas must be transported to and consumed in California, but, but again, this can make a big difference in getting a capital project off the ground. So Randy, I was just going to uh, uh, flip it over to you to kind of get your perspective since you're, you're in this business uh, commercially to kind of uh, understand your point of view on the supply and demand picture for biogas. Yeah, so uh, 
while the renewable ex renewable natural gas coalition estimates there's going to be about 167 million ethanol gallon equivalents uh, in 2014, an important thing to understand is that the renewable volume obligation that's been proposed by EPA only calls only calls for uh, approximately 23 million gallons. So there's a range of 17 to 23 million. Um, we are expecting that that cellulosic RVO uh, once they finalize Pathways 2, which we hope is ahead of the final renewable volume obligation, the, uh, uh, that cellulosic number will go up in line with the expected production. So EPA, we know, is consciously looking at what the expected production is from the biogas universe, and uh, we're hopeful that they're going to take it into consideration in 2014 so that the market will be adequately supplied, not oversupplied. Um, so so we're, that's something to watch out for, just understanding and, and unlocking the value of biogas once Pathways 2 is done. Um, and just talking about the tolling capacity, the tolling capacity in the United States, there's plenty of tolling capacity as far as CNG and LNG. If you look across the United States, when you match the amount of biogas to the amount of CNG and LNG for RINs. Um, just touching on what Susan talked about, what we do see limitations is in the California market. The California market can absorb the amount of excess biogas that's out there. Uh, the real restriction's been is that not all the CNG and LNG players in California ha have yet begun uh, taking biogas or have been open to taking biogas yet. Uh, once that opens up, it should be an adequately uh, supplied or, or even a, 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 a short supply market, meaning there will be more CNG and LNG capacity then there will be biogas, and, and we expect that also because uh, the California CNG LNG market is growing pretty quickly. And and when and the last thing I would say is when RNG Coalition, when you look at the 167 million, they were very careful to look at contracted supply. So the actual biogas universe uh, could actually generate more than that. This is just the amount that is available for transportation. Much of the biogas in the United States is contracted into electricity contracts throughout the United States, uh, many of which are in California. Um, so when they looked at that, they were just looking at the excess supply above and beyond uh, long-term contracts in place to the power industry. Um, so we, that was taken into consideration. They did a very good job there. So that's a realistic number we see in 2014. Some of that will be adjusted based upon when we get pathways to and you know, when we actually move from a D5 categorization into a D3, meaning moving from an advanced biofuel into a cellulosic fuel. Got it. Got it. That's great. Really appreciate that that perspective. Um, and, and just, you know, we've been talking about kind of what things are 2013, 2014, but if you look at, you know, natural gas vehicle demand based on what the EIA data shows here back from 1998 through the current, which is the beginning of 2014, um, you've seen a, a pretty steady growth rate of natural gas vehicle fuel consumption. And I think that, you know, as Randy was talking about, there are even more motivations now for that with, with credits uh, and, and and California market starting to open up. Um, you know, additionally, I think, you know, Randy, we were talking earlier that, you know, it seems like that there is a new CNG LNG project kind of popping up every day that you hear about. So there's definitely been, uh, you know, increased adoption recently kind of going along with this steady growth trend. Um, and, and then, you know, there's an American Clean Skies report that that's projected that, you know, more than 700 BCF of natural gas will be consumed, you know, in 2025. Personally, I think it's very, uh, you know, I think it's good to, to look at outlooks like that and see what's possible and projected. It's definitely difficult to predict uh, what happens that far out, but certainly what we're seeing from the markets now and uh, seeing from capital investment, this is definitely a growing, uh, growing industry. Uh, Randy, anything more to add there? Nope. Well done. Very good. So let's flip over to a minute to renewable electricity. And the reason why we're talking about renewable electricity is because the Pathways 2 proposed rule from the EPA, uh, this is the first time there's actually been a pathway created for renewable electricity. So, so we just wanted to, to, to take a quick look at the you know, potential supply. Um, if you look at the capacity that's out there and, and have a, you know, an assumed converted fraction value of around half, then you, know, you get to somewhere around uh, you know, 9.7 million megawatts of renewable 
renewable electricity from landfill gases and also from landfill gas and also methane digesters. So the vast majority of that, of course, is from uh, landfill gas, just because of the the quantity of energy that's available from the landfill versus the digesters. So. So you're talking about, on a supply side, an equivalent of about 429 uh, or 430 million ethanol uh, gallons. Um, how, however, where you start to run into limitations under RFS2 is that RFS2 requirements dictate that RINs can only generate for fuel use for transport. And there are very specific rules about what qualifies as transportation. Right now, the way things are shaping up, it looks like transportation use is going to be defined as electric vehicles. So, you know, if you look at the U.S. commercial fleet size, it, it's somewhat substantial, um, you know, maybe about 20 percent or so if you were to count. fleets of vehicles that are uh, not individually metered. So we're going to lose some of that. Um, so I know a lot of people get excited about the size of that market. We see limitations to that market just because it is going to be very regionally specific, and it's going to really take cooperation through the utilities um, to get them at, as the retail deliverer to support the data requirements you have. So it's, it's an exciting opportunity. But until we see more individually metered usage, um, it, it will be somewhat limited. Very good. That's very, very, very helpful to know. And I think you know, important consideration again as people are looking at you know potential opportunities and investment in the space. Um, so, so now I would like to, we've kind of set the stage of, okay, what does this space look like commercially in terms of, uh, you know, very high level picture of supply and demand and, and some of the, the matching to, between supply and demand and some of the potential limitations. So, so now what we'd like to, to switch over to talk to is to talk about the old and the new. So with, with Pathways 2 being the new proposed rule for uh, RFS2 that affects biogas and renewable electricity, how does that look like compared to what's in place now, what's new, and, and what has effectively remained the same? So, and this is intended not to be necessarily a comprehensive review of the proposed rule changes or the existing rules. Um, certainly for the sake of simplicity, we're not getting into renewable energy used for processing of other renewable fuels. So if you're using biogas, let's say, for uh, producing ethanol as part of the process heat. So uh, if you have questions about that, certainly please reach out to, to myself and, and, and Randy and Iris, and, and we'll definitely provide you more information. But what we'd like to do today is kind of give you an overall perspective on where the pathways to rule um, is going. So, so in the current biogas definition, and and you know, 
these slides, by the way, will be available after the presentation, so we may kind of buzz through some of these things without everybody having an opportunity to read the text, but, but they'll be available after. So, so the main change between the current definition and the proposed definition of biogas and pathways too is basically the definition expands and, and, and I think gives more uh, clarity in talking about what's included in waste digesters. And, and Iris, I thought you had some really good perspective when we were having a conversation about this, this earlier, if you wanted to, uh, to chime in and talk a little bit about that. Sure, right. Um, yeah, so I think here what we see with the, the proposed changes to the definition of biogas um, is certainly to add a little bit more clarity. Um, I think EPA received a lot of questions on you know, what was qualifying as biogas and, and specifically, um, you know, there were, I think they needed to provide a little bit more detail there. So um, one thing you'll note between these two definitions, um, EPA is proposing expanding um, the digester gas definition, um, so beyond manure. Um, originally, um, they had primarily just been focused on um, biogas produced from my manure digesters. Um, so here you'll see that um, they've expanded to more generically um, reference um, you know, animal wastes, oils, fats, greases, um, separated food waste, and so forth. Um, so they're um, certainly um, welcoming in um, you know, other um, co-digested um, feedstocks um, into the production of biogas. Um, and then also some clarity um, on the waste uh, treatment gas and biogas that may be generated, um, again, from wastewater treatment plants. Um, and as we'll see on the um, forthcoming slides, then they're also distinguishing a bit more between landfill gas and then what I think we call these other um, biogases um, as they define you know, the, uh, the RIN classification and so forth. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we've seen in one case where this, this definition is going to help where you had an, an animal waste digester that may be use some, using some other biogenic waste to help with the digestion process. And there were a lot of questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions with the existing definition. Well, you know, what counts for run generation and what doesn't? Do I have to separate those things? So I think that this will make things simpler from, from a, a commercial operational standpoint as well. So so I think it's good. Um, the Looking at the table, 1426 is the next thing we're going to talk about in terms of the current and proposed uh, rule. For the renewable natural gas pathways, as, as Iris was discussing, um, currently what the, the, the rules say is that the regs have one basic pathway for biogas, and they call the feedstock actually um, the, the type of operational plant that is creating the, uh, the biogas. And so the production process in this case with any was a decode of five. Now there are actually two proposed pathways. Um, <clears throat> notice that the fuel type is more specific, so it needs to be renewable compressed natural gas or renewable liquefied natural gas. So that's a change from the you know, other fuel type, which was generally just biogas. And then the feedstocks uh, are actually biogas, uh, where that was the fuel type before. And then you know, in row Q and row U there, uh, the biogas from waste treatment plants and waste digesters is separated out from landfills. And of course, the big difference between those two things is the decode. So what's being proposed is that biogas from landfills that is used for RNG, uh, that, that is CNG or LNG, will qualify as a cellulosic type fuel. So, Randy, I mean, you were talking about that that earlier. You know, those could be sounds like um, from from what we're hearing that that the cellulosic RVO may actually start to take some of this in account as the pathways to go through before the RVOs are finalized. Yeah, I mean, th that's that's certainly the plan we're hearing, which is that they're working on pathways to they're working on getting the estimated production right to take that into consider consideration with the RVO. It looks like the, the RVO probably won't be set till mid to late summer now. Uh, they did receive comments. Um, I, I just saw the number, uh, about number of comments they saw, but it was obscene. Um, I, I think it may have been over 100,000 comments they received on the RVO. Um, so they're, uh, they're going to go through that. They're going through their process. There's, you know, and, and really, if you look at a lot of the comments, the comments are really setting up for litigation. So we still have an uncertain future in, you know, even when it's that, you know, how litigation could take effect there. Um, an important differentiator is not all biogas is the same. So uh, landfill gas uh, to CNG, LNG would be recategorized as a D3. 
uh, anaerobic digestion would remain a D5. Uh, they haven't taken any action to change that. Uh, so that is an imp in, uh, that's an important differentiator. Also, it's a, uh, important just to clarify. So if you generate RINs prior to pathways 2 being complete, uh, those are D5s and will remain D5s. There's not going to be any conversion of the RINs you generate from D5 to D3 after generation, or at least we don't anticipate that. So whatever you get now, that's what you get as far as D5s. Um, and then once Pathways 2 comes in, uh, that's when the D3, uh, the D D3 recategorization will take place. We think there's going to be some action needed um, for that recategorization. It won't be that you just get the, you won't get to just flip a switch. I think there will be some additional data that EPA asks for about the facilities. Um, but I, we think it's going to be relatively benign that if you get through the current registration process, you should be in good shape. Uh, moving from a D5 to D3, but it's not going to be just pathways to get done. You're now generating a D3. There may be some action that's needed, so that may delay it just a little bit longer. Sure, sure. I mean, that, that makes sense. There would need to be some sort of transition procedure in the registration. Now, yeah, that's, that's really helpful to know. And then on the renewable electricity pathway, this is a this is a new pathway. You would, if you've taken a look at any of the the RFS2 Title 40 Part 80 section uh, subsection M uh, regs, then you'll notice that there actually is mention of renewable electricity throughout the existing regulations, but no pathway. So Pathways 2 actually proposes a an RFS2 pathway that would be rent eligible for biogas from landfills, also with the decode of three. So this is the first time this has actually appeared as a prospective pathway um, within the RUGS. And then, uh, again, I just want to go through these, these, uh, these quickly, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what, what are the biogas qualifications for RENs and what are the renewable electricity qualifications for RENs. Um, here we're only showing the proposed regulations. I will say that there, there aren't a lot of um, fundamental differences between the existing 80.1426 on these qualifications for RENs and the proposed regulations. What is different um, is that there is a breakout of renewable electricity and biogas where a lot of things were lumped together in the previous rule. So there are some nuances that are changed between the two. Um, also, we, we've, we've focused here on the proposed rules for pipeline transmission for gas that's going onto the pipeline. Um, but the proposed rules for biogas not introduced onto a pipeline are very similar. In other words, you would still have to have a written contract of sale, uh, use the fuel as transportation fuel, but the traceability is inherently simpler. So, so these two cases aren't broken out here just for the sake of time. So, so just to run through the table that's presented, or the, the, uh, the bullets that are presented here, um, to be able to qualify for rents, you have to have a, a written contract of sale for a specific quantity of fuel. Uh, that's derived from the sources that meet the pathways that were that were shown in the previous uh, slides. And then the party it has to be a party to that contract has to actually use the fuel that's taken from the commercial distribution system for transportation fuel. Um, and, and again, that's that's somebody that can take the fuel or use as transportation fuel, but they have to be a party to the agreement. You have to use the the quantity of fuel for transportation fuel and no other purposes. Uh, so no process heat in this case for, for RINs generated for pipeline transmission. Um, there, there are some that some qualifications where you can use biogas, like I said, for processing to achieve certain, um, certain uh, advanced fuel type designations for, for other fuel categories. But today we're just really focusing on the gas itself being used as a transportation fuel. You have to have a physically connected carrier pipeline between injection and withdrawal points, and that just means you have to be able to connect the dots with pipelines between the injection and the withdrawal points. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the concept of displacement at the end. You have to use the, the gas in, that was put onto the pipeline within a reasonable amount of time, uh, and, and again, to transport the gas between injection and withdrawal points. And, and really, I think that, that what we what we've tended to find with uh, what, what the EPA is saying is, is this would be consistent with the industry standard, standard of transportation time between two points. And what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, well, the the interesting thing about biogas is is, and, and I, I tell us a lot of people, it's probably one of the highest quality RINs out there because we have so much third party documentation needed uh, that just exists in the natural gas world. We have uh, third party pipeline invoices where we can show the injection. We have third party pipeline invoices where we show the withdrawals. So we we can show that on a monthly basis. The natural gas world typically settles out on a monthly basis and we don't get those invoices until the 12th to the 15th day of the following month. So a lot of times we don't have it all reconciled until you know mid the following month. But what we do is we have variable production. Typically our deliveries are rateable, so we do monthly balancing. Uh, the only thing that's important to understand is you cannot take a future day's production and credit that against the previous day's consumption. So in other words, you can't take biogas produced on tomorrow and credit it against CNG or LNG usage today. Uh, but what you can do is you can have excess biogas from today that you inject into the pipeline and you can deliver it on a subsequent day with balancing. Um, so and th there, there's some degree of reasonableness there. Uh, we haven't been any, given any clear definition, but based upon looking at the QAP guidelines, uh, what we would expect is under, let's take a QAPB, is that balancing within the quarter, as long as you balance within the period where you're being reviewed, that seems to be acceptable, but we haven't had any direct clarity from EPA saying, you know, what that balancing period is. But in the natural gas industry, clearly, uh, intra-month is acceptable, and, and there's even typically some banking, parking, or balancing between months within some de minimis threshold. So, you know, we, we feel like we can be a little bit lax there as long as we're carrying biogas forward and not trying to bring biogas back into a previous day. Right, right. That makes that makes sense. And again, you know, I think that there's still a lot of uh, a lot of guidance, specific guidance that that still needs to be resolved in terms of some of these things. But industry best practices and and current guidance as a guideline, it, it seems to be that that industry practices are kind of uh, ruling in this case. So. Um, and just a couple of other things so that you're aware of that, that the volume and heat contact of biogas injected into the pipeline and the volume of gas withdrawn to make a transportation fuel must be measured by continuous metering at both points. So just something to keep in mind operationally. Um, and then, of course, the fuel flow for transportation needs to match the volume contracted. And some things that aren't mentioned here that, that seem uh, somewhat obvious, but, but probably worth mentioning, is that no other party can rely on the contracted volume for biogas, and that's something that's a big concern that, that the EPA has, and also I think that, that buyers have, is to make sure the gas isn't double counted. Um, and then also, of course, you have to have Table 1 or direct approval for the decode qualification to, to be able to generate rents, just like for any other fuel. Uh, the renewable electricity qualifications are, are, are quite similar uh, in an, an analog, so to speak, of pipelines for the transmission grid. Um, again, the, the main 1426 differences with the proposed rules in pathway two, it, Pathways 2 and then what are the existing rules are that renewable electricity and biogas are, are broken out. There is one uh, change, and it's the last bullet point shown here, it, and, and that is proposed in Pathways 2, and that renewable electricity that's loaded onto and withdrawn from the transmission grid must be defined by the NERC regions. And so that's that's a restriction that wasn't in there. And, and Randy, I mean, is, is as far as you know, I mean, is this still something that's going to stick stick with the pathways to as it moves into finality, or do you think there's some debate on whether or not this is going to continue? Because this kind of limits the, the displacement strategy for renewable electricity. Yeah, it's, it's really going to be an, an, an interesting case. Uh, of wh whether they look at it like they do renewable natural gas, which it, natural gas, you can deliver forward haul, you can deliver back haul, and you can have pipeline documentation to support that. Um, we'll talk about kind of displacement and how that's used now, but talking about renewable electricity, uh, renewable electricity is a little bit different. You don't see renewable electricity. You don't see electricity moving over large distances because of the losses that exist in the electricity sector. And typically, sure. while you can wheel from one region into the other, we see it from NYSERDA into Neepool, MISO into PJM. There's a lot of examples where we do see electricity move. Um, I haven't been given any clarity as to what distance they're going to allow, or is it simply you can 
show that you're connected. One example would be in ERCOT, which is the, the Texas region. ERCOT really stands alone, and there are some places where we interconnect with other grids. I say we because I'm in Texas, but where we interconnect with other grids, but ERCOT really is a standalone grid in and of itself. So I haven't seen, and I, I don't expect EPA to take that into too much consideration when looking at the registration, but on the other side is I really don't see it being a limitation. I can't think of any market where you have EV load where you're not going to have enough renewable electricity from landfill gas and digesters. Again, the limitation is really going to be, you know, owning or having the right to that EV load and working with the local utility on the delivery and getting them to help and participate because that will be an important part of it. So I don't see this being a limitation commercially. And as far as directionally on the regulations, I, I haven't heard that they're going to enforce it any differently than renewable natural gas. But they, they very well may because electricity doesn't move the distances of natural gas. Sure, sure. No, that's, that, that makes sense. There is a fundamental differences there in terms of the actual movement of the energy commodity. Um, so, so our last, our, our next to last segment here, um, and, and we'll move fairly quickly through this section, we'll talk a little bit about registration and record keeping for RIN generators um, that are, that are, that are RIN gen generating RINs for biogas and um, renewable electricity. And, and I'm very pleased to be able to, to talk today about the latest guidance for biogas because there have been some changes based on what I've heard from the industry and some very recent direct guidance that we got from the EPA about what's required for engineering reviews. So, so the latest guidance uh, as of uh, basically a, a couple of weeks ago is that the engineering review required for facility infrastructure is up to the injection point on the pipeline. And again, this mainly affects, of course, um, projects that are putting gas onto a transmission pipeline. Um, the latest guidance is that engineering reviews are not required for CNG, LNG stations. And so that seemed to be somewhat of a limiting factor for uh, groups that were, were registering for RFS2 biogas projects in that contracts and affidavits are now sufficient for downstream use evaluation. If you had to go and evaluate 20, 30, 40 different CNG stations with a professional engineer in review, then that could be somewhat difficult and, and limiting um, in terms of the timing and, and, and you know, the investment into a project. So, so the latest guidance is that those engineering reviews are not required now. And, and certainly if you have any questions regarding that, please reach out to me and, and uh, also feel free to reach out to Randy and Iris about that as well. So uh, in terms of also the guidance about the registration process, we've gotten a lot of questions about who registers. Well, what, what, we've, what we've gotten from conversations uh, with, with the regulatory agency is that it, it's preferred that the registered entity maintains ownership of the gas at some point during the supply chain and is able to oversee the process from production to use. Because I think that the main concerns about compliance are, number one, is this fuel getting used as a transportation fuel? And number two, is this being double counted in some way so that RINs are being generated for fuel maybe twice or, or potentially that this fuel uh, is being shown to be contracted here but it's really going over here and, and not being used as a transportation fuel as it said it was. So this would be very akin to the position of a gas marketer, let's say. Now, now it's not excluded that other parties couldn't register. I just think that it would probably be more difficult. Um, and keep in mind, too, that the pathways tool rule isn't final, so there's still some potential flux in, in how all this is going to work. Um, the registration needs to demonstrate how the entire supply chain is connected, so actual contracts. Uh, REN generation, how all entities are involved in the supply chain. For pipeline gas, this means you also need to show that pipelines are physically connected. Um, and just some quick tips for faster processing. Um, and again, please, uh, you know, First Environment, LO Markets, and Genscape all help with facility registrations and, um, you know, have a lot of uh, uh, experience across the renewable fuel types among us. So please reach out to us if you're looking for help in this area. But some, some tips for faster processing is that you know, if you have to include an entire contract or an air permit, you can make for a really long registration document. So if you actually point to the elements of the registration and the table of contents and put the signature page or most important page of an air permit in the main body and then put an attachment or appendix at the end, that actually can help the, uh, the, the, the group that's reviewing the registration help them move faster. So. Um, so if, any comments, uh, Iris and, and Randy, on this piece? 
I'm um, sure I'll just comment. Um, I think you know, Susan's done a very nice job walking through um, you know, what these requirements are um, as far as the registration process. Um, just one thing I would note is in many cases, um, as she mentioned, you may be providing contracts or um, production data, other records um, as requested to EPA. Um, but also, um, as part of the registration process, is the completion of an engineering review um, by a third party. Right. Um, and so you would also be providing um, these records for review um, to that, um, that third party engineer who also in turn essentially prepares a report um, that's submitted as part of your registration process. Um, so just so you're aware, um, as you're compiling this information, it either um, will be seen by that engineer or may also um, be submitted to EPA as part of the registration process. Absolutely. So, so I think that um, you, that's a really good point. And, and Iris, are there are there tips that you can give you know potential registrants for biogas or renewable electricity projects on kind of things that they can do to help make the engineering review process you know easier or or uh, actually make it go faster? Sure. Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, I guess the first co comment I would make is um, to have as much of this documentation compiled and organized um, as you're putting your registration um, information together. Um, oftentimes what we'll see is um, the registration to EPA and the engineering review are being um, essentially done at the same time. Um, so there's going to be some overlap as far as um, you're putting together your registration information as well as um, you're responding to questions or supplying information um, to the engineering um, party. So. Um, again, there's just some coordination that has to be done there. Um, typically, at First Environment, um, when we're doing these engineering reviews, we try to review as much of the documentation, uh, the relevant data and records, um, as we can while we're on site um, at the actual location, the production facility. Um, so making sure that you have those records readily accessible, um, you have individuals that can speak um, you know, on these contractual relationships, um, the metering equipment, the specifications for the metering equipment, um, you know, kind of getting all the right players in the room um, to talk on those um, topics is important and certainly streamlines um, the engineering review process. Great point. I don't. I think maybe people that haven't been through the engineering review process before, um, you know, it, it's it's such a good idea to make them aware of the fact that engineering review. When you think of engineering review, you think of you know a professional engineer like yourself, Iris, coming on site with a and and, and looking at equipment and things like that. But I think what what's good to make people aware of is that this also involves comparison to documentations like registration documentations and things like that. So so I think that's a great point and certainly um, can can save a a lot of time in the engineering review process if all that's all that's together. So, yes. go, and go included, ahead. Included in that is also you, you do need to look at uh, the capacity of the facility. It's a really important component of the registration is uh, your maximum potential to produce. Uh, so you know there's a lot of actual numbers that are needed to look at historic production capacity of each one of the units. Uh, First Environment was a, was was a, was a great partner in going through that process. So we worked on it together. But our our registration packet per project was you know somewhere between 120 to 150 pages of documentation, everything from pipeline supporting documentation, the contracts for the biogas, the pipeline injection documentation, pipeline withdrawal documentation, contracts for the delivery of the biogas. Um, you know, and then and then comes the engineering review, site diagrams, other things that are needed for the for the application. And you know, what I've heard from people is, from from other people who have tried to apply, is that just if you if you submit an application, you think you're going to throw something against the wall. If you throw something in there and it's not complete, sometimes you don't even hear back from EPA. Um, the amount of attention and detail that you take up front in preparing that really does. Uh, it really does play through in EPA's consideration. Um, and given the long duration of time they're taking to get applications done, it really would behoove you to, to make sure that you're working with an engineer. And in our case, we were very happy to work with an engineer that was well experienced just because you know, we knew everything was there. I don't think they came back and asked for any additional documentation on our initial application. And it still took us, uh, this was you know, mid last year, but it still took us 
Um, I think on our first one it took us you know, 70 days. We've cut it down since then on the subsequent. Um, but it, it, is, it is a pretty intense process, and there's a lot of data that they do require. All right. I, I think it's really, you know, and it's really, you know, can be a, a benefit to have parties like First Environment, Genscape, and, and Element Markets, you know, as, as uh, compliance guidance, uh, you know, as people are going through this process. Uh, so, so definitely not not a lighthearted effort. It takes a lot of, uh, of energy and a, and a lot of documentation. And, and like Randy said, the forethought that goes into it pays off. So. Um, so I, we are getting a lot of really good questions in, and it's about 2.52 now, so we're going to go through the next couple of record-keeping slides very quickly. So we talked a little bit about registration. Uh, we'll talk about the record-keeping slides, and then uh, I want to briefly touch on QAP, and then we'll get to these questions and try to still stay on time here. So. So one thing I wanted to mention before moving off the registration guidance, you'll notice that this is just for biogas. We focused a lot on that for the registration piece here, and really that's because we haven't gotten uh, a lot of guidance yet on the renewable electricity piece. So, um, you know, if you have questions about that and you're looking at registration, registering as a renewable electricity RIN generator, please uh, get in touch with us and, and we'll help answer those questions. So. Um, so just quickly, briefly going through this uh, record keeping expectation. So what are the proposed record keeping expectations? Um, really, you need to have contracts in place that memorialize the sale and, and the title transfer of the renewable CNG, LNG, or renewable electricity for use as transportation fuel. So you need to be able to map the supply chain with documentation, specifically contracts are a big part of that. Um, you also need to be able to demonstrate the volumes that match between the source and, and the sink, and, and you also need to demonstrate the energy content and things like environmental parameters that may affect the energy content, let's say, of, of biogas or CNG. So um, that's brief, that's it in a nutshell. And then talking specifically about affidavits, so they're going to be affidavits uh, required quarterly from the biogas or renewable electricity producer, and that's the registered producer, so the REN generator, REN generator and all parties that held title to the biogas along the supply chain that basically confirms the title and the environmental attributes of the biogas and the fact that they were that this gas was only used for transportation purposes. So, so these need to be created and obtained at least once a calendar quarter. And then the EPA also asks for uh, record keeping of the, the compliance certification that's required under Title V of the Clean Air Act where this is applicable. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the um, record keeping in a nutshell. Iris, did you have some, anything to, to add here about the other documentation that may be helpful for record keeping efforts? Well, I, I actually do, Susan. This ran. Oh, okay, great. Uh, as you can tell by the voice, I don't sound like Iris. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I want to actually use this as an opportunity to answer one of the questions. There was specifically a question asked about uh, the, the deliverability of racks. Um, and, okay. and let me, let me yeah. read that question. Um, just bear with me. Uh, somebody asked, um, what's your opinion on using RECs as a way to track megawatt hours from landfill gas for renewable energy RINs pathway? Uh -huh. I, have really good, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, is from what I've been told uh, by EPA is that they don't really care about RECs. In other words, they're ignoring RECs completely. That's the good news from the perspective of, I think we're, they're going to be OK that you can get both a REC and a RIN. Now, we have to get that cleared on a state-by-state -state level, because I'm sure some states would have issue with that, and we know a couple sure. of states that may. Um, but, but just leaving that for a second, the bad news is, is that they're not going to allow you to use RECs to deliver for the purposes of generating RINs. And so really, it's not going to be as easy as I go buy a greenie REC for uh, 90 cents and I get to go generate a bunch of RINs. That, that's not the way it's going to be. You're actually going to have to de demonstrate delivery of renewable electricity. So you're going to have to show purchase of renewable electricity, which is RECs and electricity. And that entity is going to have to show delivery of, ele of the renewable electricity. Um, and in that case, it will probably only be utility who's the deliverer that can then show that delivery to meet part of their load from an RPS perspective. 
but at that point, if it was somebody who wasn't a utility or a compliance entity within the market, they would probably have to retire those recs and not sell them separately. So you can document that delivery. So that documented delivery would either have to be done on the rec side as either showing that there was a delivery made by a utility or a retail entity that's going against their RPS requirement, or they, those would have to be retired at that time. But you are going to have to show, just like renewable natural gas, that you pick it up and you deliver it. Got it. Got it. Now that's very, very helpful. Iris, any, any comments from you on that front? Uh, right. So just in uh, regarding documentation in general and record keeping, um, I guess one thing I would say is um, you know, in some cases I think the record keeping requirements are pretty clear as far as you know, having contracts in place and so forth. Um, in other cases, um, you know, I think there's quite a bit of flexibility potentially as far as you know, what records you would have to demonstrate, again, that um, the, the fuel is being used for a transportation purpose. Um, or um, the, the data that you have um, demonstrating volume um, and energy content and so forth. So I think the key thing to keep in mind is ideally you know, these sorts of records are um, as objective as possible, as kind of official as far as company records that you're keeping and maintaining. Um, where possible, I think if you have access to third-party records to demonstrate um, these requirements, that's generally considered a better type of evidence. Um, as well as then, you know, formal attestations or affidavits, as Susan mentioned, um, generally are considered um, good types of records to be maintaining. So if you have any questions um, regarding, you know, would this record suffice or is this the right sort of documentation um, to be keeping, um, certainly that's something, you know, any of us on, on the phone would be able to um, discuss in more detail. Absolutely. All right. Great, great insight there. So, so briefly, I want to talk about you know, kind of leading in with um, uh, you know, compliance being a big, a big part of this, and and being you know, somewhat challenging to to navigate for people entering the market. I want to talk about using a quality assurance plan as a way to uh, increase rent value and liquidity, and also to assist with um, any you know, uh, compliance uh, questions. So, so. What is a quality assurance plan? Well, a quality assurance plan uh, certainly in the it's in the currently in the proposed rule state by the EPA. Um, it's at actually the Office of Management and Budget. People hear that as OMB uh, currently reviewing the rule, which is the next step towards finalization. Typically, you're talking about a 30-day time period once the OMB gets the rule, at least uh, 30 days before it becomes final. So, um, so I think it's been there a week or two. So. But a quali what the quality assurance plan is is basically a way for uh, to standardize rent integrity measures um, and, and basically establish a third party verifier for rent. And so these third party verifiers are regulated uh, under the EPA. This this rule, although proposed, has provisions for. QAP within the proposed period, which uh, all, all of us on the call here are actually registered QAP providers, and, and uh, we've been doing this for quite some time. You know, Genscape's had its program in place for, for uh, over a year now for QAP. So, um, and I think First Environment and Element Markets are pretty close to that as well. But, but basically, what, what we've seen even in the provisional period is that QAP is helping. Um, it's helping new entrants in the marketplace. It's helping existing entrants uh, get better and longer-term deals for RINs, so opening up doors to strong marketers and other direct buyers where that market may not have been there before. Um, we're also seeing QAP starting to become a standard in many counterparty agreements as a standard of rent integrity. Uh, after the rule is final, we are expecting a very large push, so producers have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve still now. Um, <clears throat> we also you know, think that this is a way to commoditize the advanced rents, so to basically open the door to liquidity and improve market efficiency, and we definitely are seeing market steps towards that. Uh, uh, certainly there's still some, some fence setters uh, before the QAP rule is final, but we actually you know, starting to get calls now where people uh, that are rent buyers want us to say uh, who who are your who's Genscape's QAP um, client so that we can start buying from them. So I think these are all good signs that the rent market is starting to move to a commoditized market uh, for the advanced rents uh, with using QAP as a standard of integrity. So. It's going to take time for the RINs to be completely commoditized. There will be some adoption period, but, but we think that it's definitely moving in that direction. This, um, this actually relates to a question that we also got. 
okay, uh, sure. which is uh, somebody asked uh, about, and 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 I'm I'm going to answer this as honestly as possible, even sure. though uh, Genscape is hosting this call. Um, somebody says Randy said that biogas RINs are highest quality. If so, do you see market participants for going expensive QAPB? And so my honest feedback to that is, and, and I would say this whether Genscape was listening or not, is you know we made the decision to get a QAP agent and or a QAP verifier, QAP verifier, and the reason that we made that decision, it's we know it's the highest quality RINs. We have no problem with anybody scrubbing our work, and uh, so that and, and it's and it's fairly inexpensive relative to the value of the RIN, so that's why we decided to do it. But in addition, when you're talking about counterparties, a lot of the buyers that are out there that have to buy a billion or two billion or three billion RINs, they're not going to take the time to learn about biogas. And so the quickest way to get them comfortable is to tell them, hey, we've had Genscape review uh, our RINs. Uh, we're, we are going to be QAPB or QAPA, depending upon which way you decide to go. And it's really going to get you in the door. There are a lot of companies out there, because of fraud risk, that are not willing to take on new counterparties, and, and especially for the small amount of RINs we're talking about. I know for the biogas universe, we think of this as a big deal. But in the RIN universe, you know, having a million RINs or two million RINs to sell, it, that, that's nothing. It, it, it's a drop in the bucket for a lot of these guys. And, and you know, some of these guys, it's less than a half a percent of their compliance mandate. And so they're not going to take the time to learn about biogas. There are a few companies out there that are, that are getting educated and that are using this. And they, are, it, they do see it as a, as a great product to meeting their goals. Um, but you're really going to get the door opened by having some QAP stamp to get them comfortable that they don't have to do all the due diligence and at least a good portion of it's done. And then they may even do some more due diligence on top of that. But it gets them a long way to being comfortable having that QAP stamp on your RIN. Thanks a lot, Randy. I mean, that's a that's a great uh, perspective. Uh, Iris, any, any thoughts from from your point of view on you know the trying to to get out in front of the rent compliance and getting you know the uh, the you know the rent assurance uh, stamp? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think if anything, as we've seen also in um, you know the the carbon market, so greenhouse gas offsets, although um, you know verification. Um, has pretty much been considered um, mandatory in that program. Um, I think with any of these quality assurance um, programs, verification and so forth, just add a lot of um, you know, transparency and integrity um, to, to the market. So um, sure, sure. as Randy said, particularly in cases where um, your buyers are, are not interested in learning more about, um, about your process and so forth, having that um, QAP stamp um, I think is really important. Great. Right. Well, you know, I think this is a new, these are potentially new fuel types too. I know that, that there have been some uh, trailblazers in the biogas field, um, but, but it's starting to become more, uh, there, there's starting to be more investment in this and, and more initiative to do it. So I think, you know, uh, in, in the type of a emerging market like this, that uh, where, where RINs haven't been a big factor before, they could be in the future. And that, you know, when you're getting into something new like this, it definitely helps accelerate. So. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, over the time of, of QAP and getting more and more adoption in the category of D4 RINs, we've seen um, actually uh, our, our clients get better prices for the RINs over time. And some of this is because of the capability to secure a longer term deals, uh, sometimes at fixed price or, or um, you know, indexed to, to a price that persists and, and outweighs the cash price. So instead of say, selling month to month, they've been able to sell, you know, in, into the future. And, and also just being able to open the door to more buyers and get premium pricing because of the QAP status. So, so certainly we, uh, you know, this is a, we haven't done a whole lot of biogas RINs, and we have to protect all the confidentiality of the individual information. But uh, but this is the trend we've seen for advanced fuels. So and typically it takes about eight to ten weeks to get through the process. Um, it can be accelerated with uh, flexible availability for baseline visit and installation. So so uh, that's our content day. I, I want to uh, you know. 
put our speaker's information up here, my information, Randy's and Iris's, so you can get in touch with us at any time. Um, I know we've reached the end of our time here, but, but I would like to take the time to answer some of these great questions we have. So if the folks on the, uh, the webinar, uh, if you have time, please stick around and we'll answer these questions. Um, uh, by the way, again, we'll be sending out these slides, and, and if you have any other questions that you haven't asked during the webinar, feel free to reach out to, to any one of us, and we'd be glad to answer your questions. So uh, Randy's answered a few of the questions that we've gotten, but I think we've had a couple of questions on could we discuss the time span from the injection to the withdrawal point in terms of aligning with what the, the EPA's expectations are and the industry's expectations. And so I'll just say something brief about it. And, and Randy, I know you have a lot of expertise in this, and, and Iris, uh, I'm sure you have thoughts too. But, but basically, I think that, it, you know, again, there's, there's not super specific guidance on this, but I think that, that storage and, and things like balancing among the pipeline would be acceptable. Um, you know, I think what, what, what you couldn't do is have some unreasonable scenario where you put gas on the pipeline and had some you know indefinite period of time until you took it off the pipeline you know I think that you know essentially the the time span in which the gas is put on the pipeline and then used by the end user would have to match you know within reason the the physical uh, transport or the backhauling of, of the gas and, and that would again include storage to, to some reasonable extent so so Randy what, what are your thoughts on that well I'm, I'm going to break it in two parts there is there is a part of the rule set which does talk about that there has to be a reasonable time within the time of the injection and withdrawal um, it hasn't really been an issue for us we we primarily use uh, storage or we have uh, injection in a time that's well before the withdrawal um, but what they t I think what they typically want to see is that you inject on day one you withdraw day two for us we, we haven't paid a lot of attention to that because what we've done is we've utilized storage and created a storage position the reason we've really done that is because of the difference between variable production and the want or the need to do rateable withdrawal to utilize capacity, the tolling capacity that we have in place. Um, so we actually have physical storage positions uh, that we've taken out where we transport the biogas to inject it, hold it, and then when we go to deliver, we do it through a storage withdrawal. And so that's really been the way we've handled it. We haven't had to deal with meeting the time lapses from EPA for that purpose. So. Um, on the other side is, I, I agree, and we have talked about this, we think uh, for industry standard in natural gas certainly is intra-month you can do balancing so long as you don't bring it back. Uh, in other words, bring biogas created on tomorrow for use in a CNG or LNG today. Um, but what we would probably push for or think that industry standard would be is that you could generate it over the quarter on a quarterly balanced basis. Um, just given the way the QAPB is drafted, um, there should be some measurement, but we have not cleared that with EPA yet. We're very comfortable that intra-month or even within like a 30-day period, just from a reasonable balancing and industry standard natural gas business will be acceptable. Right, right. And, and I think just to, to elaborate on that a little bit is that, you know, basically, it, Genscape has been in the natural gas business for, for some time in terms of an information provider and you know we have a lot of uh, people with depth in the business that have been marketers and, and participated in the business and so we've tried to translate that to our, to our QAP program and also listening to our prospective and existing client base and so what we basically have is our currently approved pre-registered QAP procedure is that we're looking at balancing over a uh, a rolling monthly period so that basically, you know, like you said, Randy, it doesn't have to be a calendar month. It could actually be intra-month, um, you know, from point to point. So that's what our approved QAP procedure is, recognizing that, you know, uh, things are often balanced on a pipeline over a monthly basis. Now, now generally, We'd also specifically look at the, the fact that, you know, at any time the, the RENs are balanced with the, the transportation use, and that's kind of a different story than, you know, matching the, what's injected to what's withdrawn. So, but what's withdrawn, and then, you know, in terms of the, the, the REN generation, then that's something else we, we look at very, very closely. Um, but again, not completely related to pipeline balancing. Um, Iris, any, any thoughts there? Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. Okay, great. 
Great. Well, um, so uh, along this line, um, there's kind of a, a couple of questions, uh, you know, talking about matching. I think we've kind of covered the, the time period and, and, you know, what the expectation is in terms of the lag between production and consumption. Um, the, the other part of this question was how does all this work within the requirements to report to EMTS within five days of the date of separation and the reportable event? Um, and, and Randy, since you're, your company's actively uh, doing some of these things, I'll, I'll flip that one over to you if that's all right. I think you may be on mute. I was, but I was brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, the uh, there is a uh, there is a requirement to report within the date of separation. The batch period can actually be longer than five days, but you have to report within five days from the end of the batch period. And that batch period really starts when you have the delivery to CNG LNG. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not from the date of production. In other mm -hmm. words, not the yep. date of biogas injection. So that's an important differentiator. So I, it would be, I would have to look at the exact case, but what we would look at is when did you begin delivering, how long is your batch period, did you batch within five days of the end of that period, which that period shouldn't be any longer than 30 days. Um, so I, I think that's an important piece. The other thing, and I know we talked about attestations earlier, but kind of just to take the supply chain a little bit further and talk about the documentation required. We did talk about attestations. You do have to have attestations for the injections. You have to have attestations for the deliveries. Mm -hmm. You also have to have attestations for any of the anybody who takes title. So in the case of right. LNG, you actually have to have attestations from the LNG buyers that they're using it for transportation purposes. So there's a right. chain of events that has to occur, a chain of command that you have to have. And you do have to attest it uh, through. Um, so, but but from a batching perspective, it 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 really has to do more with when you convert it into a transportation fuel than when the biogas is generated. Because biogas, if you take a biodiesel analogy, it, it's really just a feedstock, right? So let's say it's you go to you have feedstock that comes into a biodiesel plant. Doesn't matter how long it sits there in a tank, you really have to start when that's actually batched, although you do have to have clear documentation of where it comes from, how it was documented, and have some review and some validity to the quality of it. Sure, right, right. Well, and I think uh, speaking of uh, of quality, I think that um, you know, one of the questions that came in here uh, was, was a really good question. Uh, well, they're all really, really good questions, but this is a, an important uh, kind of fundamental question is that how can you inject uh, biogas into a pipeline when pipelines can only accept methane, biomethane, or, or natural gas? And I think that it's important to know that the, you know, Inherently, pipelines can only accept a certain quality of gas. So, so landfill gas before it's put onto a pipeline uh, actually has to go through a, a lot of a, a cleaning and scrubbing process before it can meet the quality standards of the pipeline. And Iris, I know you know uh, a lot about that from your engineering experience. Maybe you could talk about uh, some of the requirements for um, the the uh, what the, bi the landfill gas has to go through to be biogas qualified. Sure, yeah, um, so exactly, you're right. There's um, you know, typically what we'll see on site at landfills, um, so at the point where the landfill gas is, is withdrawn um, you know, from the landfill itself, um, there'll be some, uh, depending on the quality of that gas um, initially, um, you know, there'll be a pre-treatment and potentially further treatment um, before um, either being injected down the line or, or straight into the pipeline. Um, and you know, Typically, you're removing moisture, um, hydrogen sulfide, um, gas compression. Obviously, also has to be um, performed um, prior to the gas being injected into the pipeline. Um, so again, it, it really um, fundamentally depends on on the quality of that um, landfill gas or biogas um, that is being generated um, and then used um, to um, be essentially treated to a higher quality um, gas. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And that, that question was really, it's, it's a little bit of semantics. So we call it biogas. We've called it biogas uh, for the webinar. Uh, but what, we're, what we really do mean is, is biomethane, right? So once it's upgraded to pipeline quality, people call it biomethane. They call the raw gas biogas. 
when we use biogas in this presentation, and, and it's really what we do mean is pipeline injected, cleaned, renewable natural gas that's cleaned to the specs of a common carrier pipeline where, wherever you are. The specs change from pipeline to pipeline. Um, and at every site that, that we have manager offtake from, uh, they have gas chromatographs there that are watching the oxygen, nitrogen, CO2, and other impurities to basically make sure the gas is pipeline spec. Um, and once it's pipeline spec and injected, you're fine. You don't have to manage the spec downstream. You don't have to manage whether the spec changes on the next pipeline. So once you're in, you're in, but you do have to meet the standards of that common carrier pipeline, whether intrastate, interstate, or LDC. Right, right. It's a good point about the semantics, too. I, I think that, you know, um, when you're talking about, you know, renewable natural gas and then, you know, the, the uh, RFS2 regulations talk about, about biogas, but then the finished project is renewable LNG, CNG. So it probably makes sense to talk about, you know, the finished product in, in the future. Just a uh, lesson learned for me is renewable uh, natural gas uh, or renewable LNG, CNG. So, so I think that's, that's a great point there, Randy. Um, yeah, uh, so a, a couple of more um, a couple more questions, and if we haven't gotten to your question today since we're over time, uh, certainly we will answer your question offline and, and basically uh, make sure that we get your questions answered in that way. But, but two more questions. So um, one of the questions was kind of following up on your conversation about RECs, Randy, is that what states have concerns about simultaneous claims for RECs and RINs for EV charging, and, and kind of why does, that, why does that concern exist? Well, I would say if uh, if anybody has that question, to just contact me directly. We we've okay, done sure, we've done. Sure. I mean, that's something where we've done a lot of work and and actually trying to reconcile that. I'll talk about kind of why more than the individual states. Um, we think overall it should be okay, but it's mainly the utilities that are the, that are concerned because the utilities say, okay, this is great. I like the idea of being able to generate a RIN, but my major thing is my compliance. I'm not going to give up my compliance. So they need comfort that RECs can be used to, or their renewable electricity that they're buying can be used to generate a RIN. Um, and a lot of states, candidly, we've gone to some states and they shrug their shoulders because they don't even know what a RIN is. They don't understand it. And so they're not mm -hmm. going to give mm -hmm. you any positive guidance. And without positive okay. guidance, the utilities don't want to do anything. So you get into this do loop of, EPA is not going to comment on it because they don't really acknowledge RECs for this purpose. Um, and then you go to the individual states and they don't understand it, so they don't want to comment on it. And so you just, that, that's actually going to be a huge limitation for a lot of utilities is, in getting comfortable is, you know, how do I know I get to keep my REC? How do I know I get to use it for my compliance? Because it doesn't matter that RINs are worth more. They're more worried about their compliance because they're a utility. That's their number right. one goal. Right. So, right. So it's yep. it's just it's yep. not an easy it's not an easy answer, and it's very much sure. going to be on a case by case sure. basis. Sure. But if somebody has an answer, it, it's a it's a long answer. So feel free to give me a call directly. Excellent. Okay, so so uh, the final question here, and I will, uh, and then like I said, we will answer the rest of the questions um, and make sure we get answers back to everyone uh, individually. Um, so the question is, uh, are you saying that a registered entity can be somebody other than the actual owner of the landfill, like a gas marketer? And I just want to be very clear, and I think each one of us can probably make, make some comments uh, on this. But from, I'll start, and from a, from a Genscape perspective, um, the, the guidance, first of all, I, I think that, you know, Randy can certainly speak about this, but, but Element Markets is a registered party in, in the biogas space as a REN generator. So, so that's kind of the evidentiary of, of, of that being part of the, the EPA's process. I think what we've gotten as guidance is that the, person, the party that registers as the REN generator or what would be officially known as the producer within the regulations would be a party that has some oversight into the, the, the transfer of the gas from party to party and also at some point in time has taken title to the gas uh, through the supply chain. I don't think that, that what the guidance that we've been getting, 
that the guidance that we've been given is that that excludes other parties necessarily from registering, but I think it would be difficult. And so, so I think, again, um, the, the guidance right now seems um, to, to include uh, multiple parties but it seems like based on the guidance we've given, a gas marketer fits best into that party to party definition as a registrant. Um, that's not to say that things won't change or, or there may be more specific guidance given in, in, in pathways to uh, once and if it becomes uh, finalized. Um, but, uh, but I think that, you know, that right now that's where things are. Uh, Randy, what are, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, and, and just, just let's just talk about history real quick. So originally sure, it was... Sure. It was the biogas producer that was the registered entity. Then in Pathways 2, they actually proposed moving it to the LNG and CNG entity. I think what EPA's come down to is, wait a minute, we really want the entity that has the most knowledge about the actual production and the actual delivery in order to have the most accurate representation of the amount that could or should be generated. And sure. so in looking at that, there's been some move to either go back to the biogas generator if they're the deliverer or some version of that in the marketer. Um, I don't know how it's going to come down to Pathways 2. What we've been able to do picking up gas from third-party sites is we were able to get registered as a marketer. Um, that's public knowledge um, with the projects being subordinate to us in EMTS, so each individual project has their own batch or their own RINs that we generate, but they're generated under our account. So we are registered as a marketer. We are the generator. Um, and, uh, and it's been also on the LCFS side. Um, the LCFS, it's kind of the same thing. On the LCFS side, CNG and LNG entities can generate LCFS credits without biogas, so they generate it from natural gas alone. Uh, once you submit a path, once you submit an individual pathway for biogas, you can um, you can generate you can become the generator. So the biogas deliverer can take over the generation of the LCFS credits for the per portion of biogas delivered, and then that CNG and LNG user would just be able to generate the rest of their credits on their own from the natural gas component. So under your pathway, you can actually do the generation. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but um, overall, both programs have accepted that the end use deliverer, the one that has that whole pathway, can be the generator of credits. Very good. Iris, uh, any thoughts on that or any, any closing thoughts? Um, right, yeah, I guess I'll just kind of echo a bit what um, Randy said. I mean, I think Clearly, the, the current regulation is, is written um, to state that it would be the producer, the biogas producer, um, so the landfill, digester, so forth, um, that would be registering as the producer. Um, but as he said, um, you know, we've seen instances where um, potentially another party, um, certainly you know, heavily involved in the process um, and owning the gas at some point, um, is able to register. So I think, I guess what I would say is um, if you have any questions on that, again, I think it's um, certainly worth contacting one of us or speaking um, with EPA. Um, I know they've um, been open to discussions about, you know, um, again, who sh who's the most appropriate um, register or producer um, in that sure. system. Sure, sure. Um, wow, yeah, so this really, uh, I really appreciate uh, Randy and Iris, both of you, uh, your insight and your depth and, and making time to be on this this webinar today. I think uh, I think it's been a, a great panel and, and really appreciate uh, all, all the contributions and, and insight that you've both given today. So, um, and certainly to, to the audience out there, thank you so much for participating in, in the, the panel today and then also uh, all the thoughtful questions and, and, and just really appreciate those and they'll certainly help uh, bring value to, to the educational value for, for the webinar. So, um, so yeah, it, it, and again, uh, final, final thought, um, 
basically you are, uh, you know, you're not alone in navigating this process. We're here to help. Our contact information is here. Please, please reach out to us, um, Randy and Iris and myself, and uh, we're happy to to help. Um, and as you're as you're working through this process, and we're we're all very much in in favor of a very uh, prosperous, renewable natural gas market and for transportation fuels. So, uh, so we certainly are, are here to help. Um, it, any other closing thoughts from from you guys? No, I'm good. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks to Iris and Randy, and thanks to our participants today. And and we'll wrap it up there. Have a have a great afternoon.